Morning everyone. It is time for biochemistry class and I am going to let everyone else listen in because I think that these topics are something that everyone wants to know about. What we're going to be talking about is a class on structural immunology. In biochemistry we start with protein design and we work our way through drug design and now we're at the point where we talk about drug design that interacts with the immune system and even designing parts of uh, proteins that look like the immune system, even designing antibodies. And so I'll have some of these. I'll um, try to start with the stuff that's of general interest first, and then I'll move on to the stuff that's more for biochemistry interest. And I'll have a little bit of theological reflection once in a while because, you know, that's uh, what I think ties it all together. And so, Let's talk about uh, structural immunology. The first thing is, how do you think about the immune system? What are the different branches? Your immune system, sometimes you hear the metaphor that your body is a machine, and there's a couple of things that that works well for, but actually most proteins, the metaphor breaks down pretty quickly. And your immune system is a living system. It's more like an ecosystem than it is like a well-oiled machine. In fact, in some ways, it seems at first like we could do a better job of designing a machine that does the same thing that it does. When you look at how the immune system actually works, you see that the way that it, in which it's living, the way in which it's messy, and the way in which it sort of has error bars and it has mistakes that look like mistakes to us, sometimes those mistakes end up making it a more robust system. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the immune system is like. We're going to start with the different branches of the immune system. Now, the thing about um, that you know about immunity is everybody's immunity is different. You get some immunity from your genes, but you get more of it from your environment and being educated. Your body educates itself on what is me, what is myself, and what is not me. Self and non-self are actually immunological biochemical categories. That's an interesting sort of psychological, sociological, theological interpretation right there. But the whole thing about, about yourself, you gauge your own immune system. For example, if you get a flu shot and you might react more strongly than someone even in your family who got the exact same shot the exact same day. Well, uh, why is that? Well, that's because there's, there's a number of reasons why it could be. But one reason that was found re recently is that it could be one particular branch of your immune system called transitional B cells that are overreacting. And so for example, um, this has a great first line, some people end up feeling crappy after a flu shot, some don't. And the reason is some people have overreactive transitional B cells. If we get a clue about whether you have overreactive transitional B cells, then we might uh, know that you're at risk for a certain autoimmune disease or you might be able to fight off a certain kind of invader better. There's a balance between those two. And because you have an overreactive transitional B cell line that um, overreacts against a particular uh, flu shot, might mean that you have something that reacts enough against a parasitic worm that invades your body. So it's all a trade-off that you're dealing with with the immune system. The immune system tries to stay in balance. You have this dynamic self, this collection of molecules that is really more important is the processes and the arrows and the reactions that go take place. And so you're not, you're much more than your atoms. Your immune system is trying to keep your atoms intact against a world that is trying to break them down for its own purposes. That's what the virus is trying to do. It's trying to take over our body, trying to take our atoms. And we're like, no, these are our atoms. We want to keep them. And so we have different branches of the immune system that deal with that. This balance that we're talking about, the transitional B cells that overreact to a flu vaccine, but might react appropriately if you were challenged with a particular infection. There's always a balance between what is overreaction and what is underreaction. And I like this figure because it shows that balance in four different ways. Remember that you have to interact with the outside world and you have to maintain the integrity of our body. Those are both the jobs of the immune system. And it has to decide, okay, this is something dangerous. I have to kill it, throw it out of my body. This is something that I can let live in my body. 
And we have a lot of bacteria, by the way. Not all bacteria are bad. There's a lot of bacteria that are good bacteria. Think about probiotics for your gut and things like that. There's a lot of those bacteria that your immune system tolerates. The immune system has to learn who is a friend and who is an enemy. And that's really kind of an amazing thing that it's able to do that. As you and your body grow and interact with a changing environment, your immune system's job is to sort of be a fence between yourself and the environment, but it needs to be a fence that lets the right things through. If it lets, if it's not reactive enough, if the fence has holes in it, then you will get infected by certain things. But of course, if the infection, if the fence is too tight, or if it overreacts against something that's actually not that bad for you, then you have inflammation or allergy. And so you can see that the immune system, if it, it, it has to uh, decide whether it's going to um, destroy a tissue or not. Because of that, it's also involved with processes of development and even cancer. The immune system's job is not just to put a fence around you, but also to monitor your body to say, is this cell growing right? Because viruses take over cells and they make them grow wrong. One of the things the immune system does is it finds those places where the body is growing wrong and it destroys those. And if you uh, think about the definition of cancer, this is exactly the definition of cancer as well. Cancer is a part of your body that's growing and it keeps growing out of control. It's like a virus is growing out of control in your own body. So you, sometimes you want to take a cell that is yours but has gone rogue and has somehow turned into a cancer cell. It's a very hard problem. How does the immune system know? It has several branches that do several different things. And so the flip side of this monitoring of your own body cells is that your, the uh, immune system is trying to stop abnormal growth well, what if it makes a mistake on that side? What if it is um, reacting to a cell that's not actually a cancer cell, as if it is a cancer cell? Then you have an autoimmune disease where the, it is attacking yourself. The immune system has a really interesting and amazing job that it's able to keep in balance between these different things. It's looking out for abnormal growth and its job is to damage tissues. It actually has chemical weapons that it uses to destroy cells in your own body because sometimes a virus has taken over a cell and the best thing for your body is to kill that cell. That's what your immune system does. It has literally cytolytic cells. That means cell cytolytic lysis breaking open. Cytolytic um, immune cells will actually do, uh, will actually destroy abnormally growing cells, but they can make mistakes and in fact the system is, even seems to be built up to expect that mistakes will be made. Instead of being all or nothing, it's actually much more of a gradient. And so the branches of the immune system, it's kind of like, where do I start and where do I stop? But there's really um, two or three kinds of cells that are most important that you'll see talked about. And for my biochemists, these are the ones you'll see talked about in papers. You have what are called macrophages. And if you look at that, phage means eating. And so these are cells that literally chase down and eat other cells. There's some great videos online if you want to look those up. Um, this is a process called phagocytosis. And it basically just means they envelop the invader. They envelop like a bacterial invader and they digest it. That's definitely a cytolytic kind of response, at least a bacteriolytic kind of response. So um, the, the other types that you might hear about, you might hear about B cells and T cells. These are actually cells with very different functions in one respect, but they're very similar in most other respects. And so it's kind of nice that their names are kind of similar. The B cells are the ones that make antibodies, and you've heard a lot about that. We'll have a whole lecture about those. T cells actually have a more complex role than the B cells. The T cells can help the B cells, there's helper T cells called TH cells. And then there's T cells that can actually, they have their own chemical weapons and they can go after infected cells. For example, if a cell is infected with a virus, because part of the issue with antibodies, antibodies only work outside cells, but viruses work by getting into cells, breaking into the cells and taking them over to turn them into virus factories. Cytolytic T, cell, T cells are able to actually monitor 
the insides of cells. There's a system that does this. That's going to be our fifth lecture when we get to that in this series. So we have definitely different branches, and within the branches we have sub-branches of branches. So it's like, where are you going to draw the line? We talked about the B regulatory cells. That's a sub-branch of the B lymphocytes, the B cells that we talked about. And so um, I'm going to say that there's a lot of different cells, and that doesn't even include the type of cells that I worked on as a postdoc. I worked on a type of cells called natural killer cells. You can guess what they do. They're definitely cytolytic, right? They're natural killer, and they, um, they are a branch of the immune system called innate immunity. B cells and T cells are adaptive immunity, and there's a big gulf between the two kinds of cells. Innate immunity are fast, but not very smart. They basically can only work against pre-programmed signals that they have. The good news is, because a lot of the viruses have these kind of signals, the innate immunity is going to actually uh, be the first to act, and it will be able to act quickly against it. Here's a thing showing time after viral infection. Right away, you end up with the blue line, which is NK cell mediated killing of infected cells. And so the reason why they're able to be so fast, they're reacting to common patterns that are on most every virus. The downside to this is the viruses can pretty quickly figure out how to evade them. If they just mutate to have a pattern that they haven't quite seen before, then the NK cell can be lost, cannot be able to react against them. Uh, so you see that there's a red line that comes later, and this line comes in as the virus titer actually goes down. It's kind of like the NK cells keep the virus under control until the cavalry can come by. That's the T cell mediated killing the adaptive immune system. This is able to respond to something it has never seen before. That's why when we have a novel coronavirus, it's mutated to the point where it's sort of getting past our first defenses, but we have adaptive immunity that's developed and we have lots of evidence that that's going on just like we expect it to. It's doing its job. B cells and T cells are adapting to react to something that they've never seen before to drive that virus titer down and to kick that virus out of your body. And the immune system has many of these branches, and they, many of them have a similar family tree. Actually, if you look up at the top here, you have bone marrow at the very top, and then it grows, a bone marrow cell can become all sorts of different cells, including, if you look all the way on the right, an erythroblast, which is a red blood cell. The bone marrow produces all the cells in the blood. And so you can have the red blood cells, but you also have the white blood cells. For example, if you follow the tree down to the left, you can see that that um, hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow can become a B cell or a T cell. And they can become effector cells. At the bottom, you see a plasma cell. And if you look carefully down there, you can see the little Y-shaped antibody. Those are the antibodies that the B cell is making. T cells, on the other hand, they just get activated and they have different jobs, a little bit more complicated for them. Then you have a whole host of cells in yellow in the middle. You have all these really fascinating types of cells, neutrophils, basophils, monocytes, macrophages, mast cells, and dendritic cells. These are all involved with the si signaling and they support the adaptive immune system. And there are some components that ha involve the innate immune system as well. Mostly we're gonna be talking about adaptive because that is the most amazing system and it's also the most effective. If you look down there, there's our macrophage, which was one of our branches. It is a type of cell. It grows up from a different type of, of, of cell. And I like this figure because it shows you a little bit of what the cells look like under a microscope. They look a little bit different under a microscope, although to really tell them apart, you need to de detect the proteins on their surface or do something like that. This is what they actually look like. If you have a lymphocyte, it's resting, then it gets activated when you have the bad thing come along, the antigen that activates the immune system, the virus. And so it becomes a lymphoblast as it grows up. And as it becomes activated, it becomes a, a B cell, an effector cell, which could be a B cell or a T cell. Uh, these all look a lot the same because they're very related but they do have different roles, different functions, and different proteins on their surface that make them work. 
So um, the interesting thing about your immune system, like I said, it's a lot of blood cells, white blood cells, but there's also a transport system like a set of service roads in your body that will actually be able to, to um, carry those that is not related to the blood. So they have kind of two systems they can circulate through the body on. I think this is fascinating. It's called the lymph as a system. And if you've heard of your lymph nodes, those are kind of the truck stops along the road where they all gather together and they, um, they have special functions where the cells gather and they're even educated sometimes in the lymph nodes. So um, this ex extra road system is just a, a fascinating sort of topic. And I just want to say um, the immune system branches will use this road system as well as some of them will get into the blood. Now, the way that we can see the lymph system, how the lymph system works, it actually is able to sample parts of your whole body. Um, and the way that we see that working is actually by looking at, this is a little macabre, but we look at tattooed corpses. Okay, so when you donate your body to science, if you have a tattoo, um, the scientists can look at that and they can actually see evidence that the tattoo has been detected by your immune system. That's what this paper is right here. This is the idea of the paper. When you have a tattoo, and they literally have this uh, title at the top, Tattoo Kinetics. So let's learn some tattoo kinetics. When you get a tattoo, um, you get the, the, the uh, tattoo dyes and inks are going to be injected below the skin surface where they stay even though your skin gets shut off. Uh, and they stay there, and you know your tattoo mostly stays there and gets displayed. Well, your immune system is monitoring your body for invaders. And so how it's going to see, why are you injecting all this colored stuff into me? There's going to be cells that will actually sample that and get back to the lymph nodes. And also some of the, immune, some of the tattoo dye might actually diffuse passively by itself through the body to get to the lymph node as well. Whichever way it happens, the lymph nodes are designed to be where parts of the body collect. They kind of surveil the whole body. And so you end up with tattoo particles in there if you have a tattoo in you. The way we can actually see this is you can actually see the lymph nodes in people with tattoos have little colored tattoo bits in them. For example, here's an azo dye, which is used um, in, in some cases as a pigment. And if you look at the, uh, the, the skin sample on the left, you can see that there's definitely some green if you look at the lymph node, you can detect some of these pigments and dyes in the lymph node itself. There's also a copper-based pigment that is shown on the bottom. That's definitely a green color in the skin. You see donor 4 has the green in the skin, and you don't have to be a scientist to look at that sample of the lymph node and say, hey, some of that copper dye has been sampled and transported to the lymph node, where the lymph node, they like get it all together and they all take a look at it and they say, hey, is this bad or not? Is this self or non-self? I just watched the Pixar movie Inside Out. And so I'm really fascinated. What if there was an Inside Out sequel that was about the immune system and you had like the B cells and the T cells? And uh, I would like to see what Pete Doctor would do with that. You probably don't want to see my version of it because it would probably be way, way too much detail. Um, but you have the idea right there that you have the body being surveilled uh, by taking samples and bringing them to the lymph nodes. Now at the lymph nodes you have the lymphocytes. Here's a picture of the lymph nodes and the idea of the lymph system. The green lines in this are sort of shown and I like this because it also shows the bone marrow where all the immune cells start. So they are born in the bone marrow, they circulate through the body, through the blood and through the lymph and the lymph nodes are where um, there's a lot of the function going on. It's why if you have swollen lymph nodes, your doctor always checks right here, right? Uh, if you have swollen lymph nodes, you might have a disease, and it's one of the signs that doctors look for. So the lymph nodes are where the immune system makes decisions, and its decisions are, should I react against this thing or not? Should I kill this cell? Is it a tumor cell, or is it a normal cell? Is this a bacterium that I need to destroy, or is it a normal good bacterium that does something good for my body or my gut. And all of these signals are taking place through the body. You have the cells themselves that are traveling through the body, but they need to talk to each other. 
And the way the cells talk to each other is either through the receptors on their surface, they can come up and they can, you know, sort of kiss, and they can sort of see uh, the receptors come together and you see they can interact that way. But sometimes the cells want to talk from a distance. They want a um, phone line rather than to be able to be in contact with each other. To do that, what they use for their phone line is they put soluble proteins into the body that flow through the blood, for example, and go to other cells. Other cells will detect that. These soluble proteins are really interesting because we can make proteins in biochemistry. It's what I teach my students to do. And so maybe we can make some of these proteins. Maybe we can even design them to try to make them work better. They're just regular old proteins made out of the same 20 amino acids as all of their other proteins. We can make those in the lab. In fact, it's what my students do. So uh, you can see that you have this sort of figure that shows you can have different kinds of immune responses. Like you say, you can have overreactions or underreactions. You're trying to find the happy medium between those. What I like about these is it has the same t different types of responses. Here it's to different sort of uh, antigens or different infections. And so you have, uh, for example, you have the, the different types of responses and they're mediated by protein signals called interleukins and interferons. For example, right here you see helminths. Helminths are, it's a hard thing to say, but it basically means worms, okay? Parasitic worms get into your body your immune system detects them and says, hey, this isn't supposed to be there. One of the signals that it uses when you have a helminth is that it starts sending out the interleukin called IL-33. IL-33 will activate the immune system to say, hey, come over here and kill this worm. The interesting thing is also, if you notice, IL-33 is a type two response. So if you have a worm and the IL-33 is, is activated, then that's all good. Your immune system goes and it attacks and it inflames and you have a lot of, you know, you might have fever, you might have rash and things like that, but that's good because it's signs that you're killing cells and fighting what you need to do. What if the IL-33 accidentally gets released? What if you have an immune cell that makes a mistake and starts to make a lot of IL-33 and then it gets all its friends together and they all start to say, oh my goodness, and they start to put out IL-33. They could be mistaken, mistaking a good, perfectly tolerable protein for a bad helminth type protein. If you have that case, you have an overreaction of IL-33 and you have an allergy. In fact, we can even see why they react to certain proteins. And we can say, hey, that mistake you made, it actually makes sense because that allergic protein actually does look like this other bad protein. We're gonna talk about that cross-reactivity when we get to it. The whole thing right now is this is mediated by IL-33, which is a protein that dissolves in the um, soluble parts of the body and moves through the body like a protein in water. So IL-33, I exactly mentioned that because when poison ivy contacts the body, it sets off the immune response that makes cells that make the IL-33. And so that results in the rash and the itch. And here's an idea where, where they really trace this down. Complex system, hard to trace down an exact part of it. But in the mouse model of poison ivy, they found out that definitely, yes, IL-33 is a, an important signal sending the rash and itch response. So if you think about it, we have this protein. We know its shape. We can make proteins like that. So why don't we find a way to pull that protein out of the system? Then we'd have a way we'd intercept the signal and we would keep the immune system from overreacting so much because we have taken the signal and we have turned it down. And in fact, we can even see the IL-33 binding to its receptor. This is the cell receptor that binds to it. The purple is the IL-33. This is what proteins look like. Um, biochemists, you are very familiar with all this, right? Uh, and its receptor forms a sort of sea claw that sort of claws its way around the IL-33. Well, if you can have a receptor protein that binds to the IL-33, and if you want to make another protein that binds the IL-33 and pulls it away, then what, what if you get your immune adaptive system to make antibodies that will grab onto your IL-33 instead. If they're grabbing onto it, the receptor can't grab onto it and you don't have the rash and itch. 
So, and this is exactly what can happen. An IL-33 neutralizing antibody is just an antibody, it looks like this, and it's another protein that is able to grab onto the, um, the protein that you want it to grab onto, the offending protein, the antigen is what we call it. So cytokines mediate not just poison ivy, but their cytokines in COVID-19. And so you might have heard of the cytokine storm that happens in some patients late in the progression of COVID-19. In fact, it's entirely possible that this cytokine storm is more dangerous than the virus itself, but it's what makes viruses dangerous. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it's definitely, um, just realize that if the immune system is overreacting, maybe we can turn the immune system down. One of the ways in which we see the immune system overreacting in late stage COVID-19 is a high production of IL-6, which is associated with, with fever. And as you know, fever is associated with COVID-19. So that's, people have got the idea, why don't we do the th same thing? Why don't we have an IL-6 neutralizing antibody? And that in fact is one of the ways to treat that's coming down the road. You might have heard about these, and we'll have a little bit more evidence about this when we talk specifically about SARS-CoV-2 in a couple of lectures. So that we could uh, grab onto the IL-6 with antibodies and pull it out of the system. Or we can actually filter the blood, right? We can have dialysis machines that serve the same function as the kidneys and uh, filter the blood as it passes through. There's actually a mechanical filtration possibility to filter out the nasty IL-6. There's, um, by the way, this thing right here, if you see this IL-6 antagonist, toc toxilizumab. I'm, I'm just a biochemist, so I can't say these things. Uh, but there's a toxilizumab and Sarah's Seralumab, um, yeah. I can't say the rest of them, but I can see in both of those, there's an AB at the end. The AB stands for antibody. When you see that in a drug, you know it's some sort of antibody, which is a protein that binds other proteins. In this case, a protein that binds the IL-6 protein. So yeah, there are lots of possibilities. Once we know what the immune system is doing, then we can use our biochemical knowledge to go after those particular atoms while not messing with the rest of the atoms in our body. It comes down to the atoms and we can manipulate those in certain ways. Because the body is so complex, the virus itself is actually pretty simple. Its genome is only 30,000 nucleotides. That sounds like a small amount until you realize how many, gene, how many nucleotides are in a human genome, orders of magnitude more. So, the virus is much simple. In fact, it's so simple, some people debate whether you should call it alive or not. But because a simple virus is infecting a complex human body and throwing it out of whack, it's going to produce complex and unpredictable outcomes depending on the complexities of that body, both the genetic and the history of the environment that that body has, invo has involved. It's nature and nurture. It's not just about your genes, but it's about the environment as well. So here's um, an article that talks about this. It's, uh, we've known who's at high risk for coronavirus. And I think that one of the things about coronavirus is it has some very distinct tendencies. Let's find out how it plays this game so that we can beat it at its own game. Older people are at very high risk. There's a very strong age-dependent curve here. People with underlying conditions, and the question is which underlying conditions? Diabetes and cancer are high-risk um, conditions. Obesity is another high-risk condition. I remember when Italy was first being overwhelmed, the doctors there were saying, we're seeing a lot of um, patients with obesity here. And that pattern has held true no matter which, whatever country that this virus has come to. There, um, ethnic minorities are more likely to die. This involves not just the body, but also the social setting, the social environment that people are involved in. And that's, um, that's the thing that we've got, to, we've got to remember. This virus does discriminate because people have been discriminated against their whole lives. And so we can look at that and we can see who needs to be most protected as well, who is most at risk. There is some good news. Because it's a lung-based disease, we thought asthma would be a risk factor. But according to this article, at least, they don't see, asthmatics don't seem to be in greater danger. 
So as a former asthmatic myself, um, that's something that just lets me know, okay, maybe in this one category, I'm not as high at risk. And there are some categories. This virus does have tendencies and it has a personality. We've got to find out what those tendencies are. And so remember that the immune system is as much about the host as the pathogen. The whole point of the immune system is to define the self. And that's a very complex biochemical problem. So in fact, you can see this in many places. The same virus is going to affect different people differently. The same DNA for a fungus, the same species of a fungus, can react very differently in different people. There's actually a case where we thought that we had two funguses, two fungi, uh, but they turned out to be actually the same fungus with exactly the same DNA once we sequenced their DNA. Same species, but one of them would infect certain kinds of people and would resist drugs. And that's a, um, it would cause yeast infections and it would show up most in immunocompromised people. There's another, um, it looked like it was a different one, which was used in food fermentation. People would use it, but they would never know because they didn't have the immunocompromisation, the immunocompromised nature that this um, pathogen exploits. And so same DNA, one was used to make food, and same DNA will infect another person. But then there's people who will never be infected by it. We've got to realize that immune systems are very different and the more we know about who is at risk and who is not, we can use that to have a nuanced view of what is the risk for everyone. I'm hoping that we can get more and more information about this as we go along. I have a friend in a Florida hospital, and he actually posted this. Um, he uh, noticed these same things. And so it doesn't matter if you're in Italy, New York City, China, Florida, you see the same kind of things. And he's saying, for some reason, uh, there's a risk, a link between insulin resistance, diabetes, and an overreactive immune response, a cytokine storm type thing, which dramatically worsens the outcome for patients. Doctors know this, and uh, I believe he's a pharmacist. Uh, people working in the hospitals know this. And so we are getting more and more data as we see the patients come in, which will help us to understand this is a clue to how the virus works and it might be a clue to be able to get rid of it, or at least to be able to tell who is at the most risk. Uh, so remember the body is constantly making and destroying molecules and cells. You're constantly eating, you're constantly excreting. You are um, a dynamic system that's a collection of atoms, and these patterns pretty much hold the same. You're the same pattern that you were before. You are much more than your patterns, but when we're dealing with biochemistry, we're dealing with the patterns of atoms themselves. So uh, the body is in a dynamic balance. You eat, you excrete, and in the middle, you stay the same. It's called homeostasis, a word that the biochemist should remember. So the, um, the thing is, when these cycles fall out of balance, the immune system can go out of control, and it can result in too much interleukin or interferon, and if you have a problem with your cycles that digest and transport sugars, one of those is diabetes. Diabetes is a problem with that cycle. A problem with the sugar cycle can be related to a problem with the immune cycles because they are related and immune cells need sugar, they need fuel. And so there's all sorts of cycles that are um, related here. So uh, one example, here's an example from a flu infection that is probably similar to what's going on Diabetes means you have high blood glucose, you have um, dysregulation of your sugar systems in your body. There's a kind of sugar called UDP uh, glycnac, which is uh, an, acetyl, an inacetyl group on glucose. Biochemists, you should be encountering this in biochemistry too at some point. It's the UDP system. And you can tell that the UDP system is usually used for building sugars onto things. For example, if you have glycoproteins that need sugars, the, this UDP system will put the sugar onto that, make a glycosylated protein. But if you have too much of the UDP sugar, then you end up with too much sugar on certain proteins, glycoproteins, and one of those glycoproteins is IRF5, which stands for interferon regulatory factor 5. And you might be thinking, uh-oh, interleukins and interferons are exactly what we're worried about. So diabetes, too much sugar 
on an interferon regulatory factor, which means too much interferon made, too many cytokines, too, and a, a potential for a cytokine storm. Because these uh, interferons are regulated by glycoproteins that have glucose on them or glucose-related molecules on them, then the, um, the diabetes can affect how your cytokines work. And this is exactly a, this connect, paper connects the dots. So metabolism, biochemistry too, is full of these cycles. And you have a lot of circles, you have a lot of arrows that go in one way, but those are actually just half cycles. If you look at it from a broader standpoint, everything is a cycle in life because everything is dealing with a system where stuff's coming in, stuff's going out, and you have reactions that are going in little circles. This means that they are reciprocal and they're even contradictory because you have cycles that build and cycles that break down. And the point is not to stop the cycles so that we stay in a constantly built situation. We have uh, building and breaking down are both essential parts of being alive. Immunity is composed of cycles like metabolism, but they're on the level of cells rather than molecules. And you have cells that build up, cells that grow and develop, and you have cells that break down. A time to kill, a time to uh, be born to quote Ecclesiastes. So the thing is metabolism that you learn about in biochemistry too and immunity are related. Some T cells become really long lived memory cells with different metabolism. And so a different type of immune cell, different branch will have different uh, metabolism. This right here just shows that when you have naive T cells before they encounter antigen at all, when they encounter it, they become effector T cells, which means they're growing, they're reacting, they're fighting off the virus. Then the virus is kicked out and then they calm down. You need the immune system to turn itself off when the invader is pushed away. So the effector uh, T cells need to switch and a few of them stick around. They become memory T cells, but they live at a different tempo. They're not growing as much. They're hanging out and they want to grow slowly so that whenever that uh, bad stuff comes back again, they'll be ready for it. And the question is, how effective are these cells? How long do they last? We're still figuring that out about COVID, but we're hoping that we have a normal response at least to COVID where we have a bunch of memory T cells that stay around. Because these cells live at different tempos, they have different metabolisms that are actually um, part of that. And you'll notice for the biochemists, Effector T cells have anabolic metabolism, the kind of metabolism that builds. Memory T cells, on the other hand, have catabolic metabolism, the kind of metabolism that breaks down. And they're just basically breaking down energy and they're sort of waiting it out until they're needed again. If you need to grow, you need to build and you need anabolic metabolism. There's tons of reactions that are associated with each of these and they're all the biochemistry cycles. So different immune cells beyond just memory versus um, naive T cells have different metabolisms. In fact, you could often argue that there are met metabolic signatures for the different branches of the immune system. Here's something that shows all the cycles of biochem two. And so biochemists, they should look familiar to you. You have the glycolysis, you have basically the, glyco the metabolism that depends on oxygen, which is in the mitochondria at the bottom, aerobic, and you have anaerobic, uh, cases, which is uh, glycolysis by itself. You can also have glycolysis that takes place in, uh, in aerobic conditions, and that's what I believe they're saying here. Um, basically, a lot of biochemical detail, but this shows which parts of the biochemical circuits are sort of turned on and off. Are you building or are you breaking down? And um, this is a cool review about immunometabolism. I just want to show for the people who, who find out more about this, Here's seven different types of immune cells. The red are cells that are tearing down and they tend to do anaerobic metabolism. Tearing down means you need to, um, uh, you're, you're going to be using the glycolysis, you're going to be eating sugar, you're going to be doing anaerobic glycolysis, um, anaerobic systems. Blue is at cells that are more building up. If you have the naive lymphocytes, they're hanging out, waiting around, memory T cells in this case, they're building up and waiting around. And so this is more aerobic. You see more of the citric acid cycle. You also see more anabolism than you see catabolism. 
things that kill are tearing down. They're going to do catabolic processes. And you can see they're colored red here. They have a lot of the glycolysis that's going on. By the way, I'm summing up a, a whole complex field here. So it might seem that some of the things are contradictory, but we'd have to look at the papers to see exactly what it is. The main thing is metabolism is involved with the immune system breaking down or building up. Different reactions go with different types of cells. And in fact, different reactions go with different sub-branches as well. If you have the T cells, you see at the bottom here, you have six different sub-branches of T cells. You have uh, several different kinds of T helper cells. You have several different kinds. You have T memory, you have T reg, you have alloreactive T cells. And you see that these different categories have different red arrows next to them. The red arrows mean that they, um, after they differentiate into these kinds of cells, they have different receptors on the surface, but they also have different metabolisms on the inside. They live in different ways and they have different biochemical patterns there. So just like diabetes is connected to um, cytokine storms, here we have metabolism of sugars, how the cell burns energy or builds molecules is connected to the subtype of cell. This is immunometabolism and I think it's a fascinating way to start this off because the biochemists um, can see an application of your metabolism. Now I've always got to talk a little bit about oxygen because oxygen to me is what metabolism, aerobic metabolism depends on. Metabolism makes energy from oxygen for the immune system to use and the immune system is burning through a ton of energy. Your brain and your immune system are probably the biggest energy hogs in your entire body. So the brain uses a lot of oxygen. Oxygen, in fact, there's an argument in my book that oxygen was necessary for the amount of energy that you get for a brain. Oxygen is very special. It's extremely reactive, and it's common, and it's available. So you, you use this reactivity when you breathe it in, and you combine it with sugar to essentially burn the sugar and make energy. This, pr this has a side effect, though. Just like when you burn something, you end up with smoke coming off. Here you end up with sort of chemical smoke coming off in the sense of you have half-reacted oxygen molecules. And the thing about half-reacted oxygen molecules is they are extra, they want to react even more. And they get out of the, the part of the cell where they're supposed to stay. And then they go around and they start reacting with stuff. It's like if you have a fire, the fire can get out of control. It's true for the little fires that are involved in your metabolism as well. It's just that the byproduct, the smoke, is the reactive oxygen species. One example is, by the way, this uh, superoxo anion that's shown on the, um, on the right side of the figure there. The, and by the way, biochemists, see the molecular orbitals. Dr. Bartlett would be proud if you could look at these and think about them. But um, I'm not going to go into that detail. Basically, I'm just going to say oxygen can form very reactive and dangerous uh, chemicals like the superoxide that you see there. So these will damage DNA, which is really bad because if you damage DNA, not only are you damaging yourself, you're damaging, uh, if you're damaging the cells that you pass on to future generations, you're damaging them as well. Uh, and frequently when you damage DNA, you cause an abnormality in growth and you cause cancer. There's just so many proteins that are involved with cancer, gro with cell growth you mess up one of those, you get a cell that's growing too much. So oxygen, in a sense, could be a cause of cancer. You're not going to get away from that cause of cancer, let me tell you. Oxygen, uh, so, but uh, this causes a problem with, a constant problem with cancer. And there are ways that you can even postulate that there's a pathway for cells to evolve that look for characteristics of cancer and destroy those cells the cells start to develop a sense of what the self is and what they should destroy and what they should leave alone. This could be the beginning of an immune system. So in a sense, oxygen accidentally causes cancer. Cancer sort of accidentally causes the immune system that ends up protecting us not just from cancer, but also from infectious agents that are not self molecules that end up inside us. The immune cells, by the way, I said they had chemical warfare um, that they use. One of the main chemicals that they use to destroy other cells, reactive oxygen species. So I think that there's something to this theory. And this 
implies that any life that uses oxygen will develop and evolve an immune system. And that's pretty cool. That's uh, even possibly predictable. The other thing is I want to take this and I want to do a social metaphor. You probably already thought of this. A cytokine storm is where you have overreacting interleukins, right? Uh, well, we, what about when you have a, a post that goes viral, a post with misinformation or a, you know, a video that's based on one scientist saying, hey, I've got the corner on this and all the other scientists are wrong. That's not usually a good bet to make. And I'm a scientist, you can ask me what I think if you come across one of those. Just please don't ask me to watch a video because I don't take in information that way. But all we can see, we have this issue. What is the good information? What should go viral and what should not? Um, I have experience with running experiments, so I can tell what looks like a good experiment or not, by the way. And that's what I'm trying to do with these videos. So I'm trying to pass that on. I'm hoping that this is good viral rather than bad viral. Uh, but the uncontrolled replication is the issue. You have a, a post that doesn't have context or nuance. It ends up with fear spreading from person to person. And this is not just one side of the conversation that does this. Uh, basically, I see a lot of people who are very worried and afraid of this virus. Um, but then I see them drawing conclusions. They see one data point from one day of data. And they see it spiking. And they say it's spiking. You see that word that the virus is spiking. Usually, that's a sign that the data is bad. The virus spiked in New York City. I'm not sure that it spiked in rural places where we see a one-day increase in cases. We have to watch and we have to be very careful how we use inflammatory words like the word spike. We might be seeing noise in the data. There's a lot of noise in this data, so that's why I look at data by weeks and months rather than by days. So uh, there, I draw from this metaphor, there are regulatory T cells that act as peacekeepers that calm down a cytokine storm. And so I just want to say um, that's a metaphor applied from the social world to the biochemical world. How much more does that apply to be a peacemaker, to be a regulatory T cell that calms down the viral post rather than passing it along to inflame people? Um, Blessed are the peace keep, peacekeepers, which is what I'm going to say. Even that shows how words can be messy and cannot um, communicate what they uh, started out intending. So we've always got to be careful, right? We've always got to be looking at the words and testing all the words. There's a great scene from Life of Brian where it has Jesus doing the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, blessed are the peacekeepers. But then the people in the back can't hear him. And he said, I think he said, blessed are the cheesemakers. And there's all sorts of things that they get wrong. I like that because not only is it funny, but it's very true. We will take the words and we will mishear them. The immune system will mishear the cytokines. We will mishear words. We've got to get back to what the original words were. And we've got to, um, the more we do that, the more we'll see the word that created this thing in the first place. So since we're already talking about theology, I'd like to say um, that this all reminds me of 1 Corinthians 12. And if you've ever studied that, you know that it refers to the church as a body with different parts of the body um, that say to themselves, oh, I'm not necessary because I'm not that other part of the body. You know, they're envious of the gifts that the other part of the body has. And Paul has this image. If your foot was to say, I'm not a hand, because I'm not a hand, I'm not really part of the body. I'm not needed. But Paul says you're needed. You need your feet. And he says you need every part of your body. And God has organized your body in this way. And he's, not t he's talking about the human body, which is organized in this dynamic sort of messy way by the immune system that even evolves to go against antigens. That's why I say that I think God is using evolution in this case to protect us from the virus in some ways. Um, when Paul says this, this is the thing to watch out for socially. For those of us who are part of the church, uh, part of any community, but this is uh, directed exactly to the church because it says that the way God has organized and he has put you in your place for a reason. I think a lot of people might be feeling kind of helpless and uh, um, useless uh, being under quarantine. But I recently read a blog post by um, a, a, a Greek Orthodox father that I follow. Uh, and he had it titled, The Useless God. God, in some senses, 
is useless. The Sabbath, Jubilee, those are times for being useless. And sometimes there's something in this quarantine that says, you think you were useful before, but sometimes God wants you to be useless and then he'll use you. You know, so the, all this is to say, don't look at what the other people are doing. Listen for what God is telling you and where God has placed you in the body. You have a job and it's messy and it's dynamic and it's contradictory. This is not a machine of interlocking gears. It's a bunch of cycles, but metabolism is related to immunity and your inner prayer life is related to your outer life socially. All these things are connected. So it's not really so much a bunch of gears. You're not a robot. You're more a messy ecosystem. You contain multitudes and you even have contradictory impulses. That's okay. And that's actually, um, I want to talk about someday about Samuel Taylor Coleridge's polar logic that's part of it. This actually makes for a more robust system. It's a more messy system and it's a more worrisome system if you look locally, but the system is actually more robust. We don't have as many blue screens of death for um, a messy dynamic system than we do for a robotic system like a computer. Think of how much your computer crashes and how many bugs it has and how many viruses go against it. And we have to get these viruses from some central case. But the body has its way of dealing with viruses that um, we can you, we can manipulate part of it, but we can it's already going on right now in you. And so if part of the system fails in your body, it's easier for another part to step in. And this messiness can actually lead to a lot of good things. We're going to have those in a couple of lectures. Your body uses this messiness, a messy evolutionary process, to design new antibodies through actually evolving the cells. Um, so I want to say that this is a different kind of logic than mechanical logic. This is a different kind of logic even than Newtonian logic where you know where every atom is and what it's doing. There's a lot of uncertainty we have, and there's a lot of dynamic cycles that we're dealing with, where time matters, where um, context matters. And so I just want to pull away to one of my uh, interesting authors that I like. Uh, he actually makes an argument like Coleridge with the polar logic that this kind of contradiction and this kind of messiness, dynamic cycles, are living logic. He points out two things. Organisms are always creating and maintaining order, but they're doing it in a fluid way, not a mechanical way. Therefore, to maintain that order, we require to eat and excrete. We require a nearly constant throughput of energy and materials. These two characteristics, Deacon puts these together and says that these give life its distinctive capacity where it's not like a robot. And you see that this kind of logic where you have, um, you, you have the ordering influence of life. Some people call it neg entropy, okay? Uh, working against the entropy and the tendency of everything to spread out and sort of even out. Life gathers together. And it does this through metabolism, development, repair, and immunity. All of these systems follow a life logic with cycles, reciprocal, even contradictory impulses. You make a molecule and you break it down right away but there's reasons why you do that. And it ends up being a more robust system in the long run, even though it doesn't make sense in the short run. And it's also how evolution fits into this. Evolution is a process that is like that. He argues that these are all products of a common dynamical logic that has to do with Coleridge's polar logic, it has to do with two opposing impulses that end up staying in the same place. All four of those are biochemical and they involve the self. What is the self? How do I build it up? What do I break down to make sure that the self is maintained? And that even gets philosophical. So I just, um, I've already talked way too long about this, but I want you to get that idea. Uh, I want you to see that God's power is displayed through this. And there's, uh, there's an author, she's a chemist, uh, who writes about the world this way. Uh, the sterilized world of church. Sometimes we sterilize, we make our church too robotic. It's often divorced from the messy real lives that people go through, but that's where God works and that's where miracles occur. So prayer is one of these things where you have a prayer that's not just going through a robotic list. 
but you have a focused expectation of God's presence and power. So God is still working this way. It's just that this is the way that God works. God doesn't make robots. We make robots. Robots are idols in a sense, and they are very useful tools in another sense. God makes us, and we have even contradictory and cyclical thoughts, right? But being alive is part of being a cycle that takes us in, and it's okay to be messy. God comes down to the mess, incarnate, um, and joins us in it. The problem isn't science. The problem is a misunderstanding of the nature of God's presence, that God is there in messy cyclical processes, which is really good news because I don't know of any better way to describe the endless Groundhog Day that people are feeling right now and the burdens that we're under. God is carrying those burdens, and um, I want to look for the way in which I can carry others' burdens. He's put us together in a body so we can reciprocally carry other people's burdens. All right, that is, um, that's uh, about twice as long as I expected, but there you go. That is my take on immunometabolism. All right.